Now that I think about it here, thank you. It may have been closer to 25 years ago. <laughs> uh, I think that was the case because one of the lectures uh, was on party building and socialist strategy, and it was reflecting on how the attempt to change the Labour Party uh, by the Campaign for Labour Party Democracy, the movement around Tony Benn, uh, et cetera, the Greater London Council, had been defeated, and why, and the implications of that. Uh, and I remember I published a long, long essay on that in the late 80s, so it must have been that early on in the Haven Center's existence. Uh, and that's you know, all the more interesting to me at least because this very week uh, we one of the young men at that time uh, most actively engaged in the attempt to change the Labour Party, which is a bit like trying to change an elephant into a gazelle. Uh, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, who had been very active in the municipal socialism stuff that gave rise to the Greater London Council. Uh, and was Ben's great young protege, uh, having been marginalized, although an MP uh, since 1983, uh, was elected leader of the Labour Party. So it just goes to show you that for those of us interested in trying to find an alternative to capitalism, nice to see you, um, to try to find an alternative to capitalism, this isn't a sprint, it's a marathon. <laughs> Uh, and that's somewhat relevant to, I think, what uh, led Eric to uh, say the positive things he said about the series of bullets and then Jack and then interventions that I did in the face of what so much of the left outside of Greece, often led by uh, militants inside Greece, were calling betrayal last July, and are still calling the trail. Um, uh, it, it was a word that I found hard to take. I even found the word capitulation hard to take. Um, but above all, I felt that one doesn't throw away a three-decade-long process of party building. A three-decade-long attempt to build a political institution capable not just of protesting, certainly encouraging protest, embedding itself in protest, etc., but capable of knocking on the door of the state, getting into it, and trying to do something. Because we can protest till kingdom come, and we won't get out of capitalism. So that led to a series of reflective pieces uh, which very much recognized the limitations of Syriza and the limitations of its strategy, the strategy of the leadership uh, to attempt to convince uh, the European establishment that they had been following the wrong neoliberal path, not only vis-a-vis Greeks, but much more generally, um, which I always thought was a dead end. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the dilemmas that anyone would face pulling out of the European Union, uh, even pulling out of the Eurozone, uh, are such that one has to understand why they adopted that strategy and would only go as far as the Europeans would let them. I'll talk about this in tomorrow's lecture. Uh, I think it's important in order to set that up to talk not about Greece, although I'll come to it towards the end, uh, but about Europe, uh, what the European Union is and has become. Um, and I want to do that in the context uh, of illusions that have been common on the left, especially the academic left. Uh, and especially on the American academic level. Uh, although they're sometimes encouraged by political practitioners in Europe. Um, and I think that the Euro crisis, 
has once and for all, perhaps, dispelled these left illusions, which I think is a good thing. Um, the European uh, experience since 2000, late 2009, in the context of this, the fourth great crisis of global capitalism, the first was the last quarter of the uh, 19th century, uh, after the 1973, the 1873 recession kicked off here in the United States. The second, of course, the Great Depression. The third, the crisis of the 70s, the stagflation crisis of the 70s, out of which neoliberalism emerged, uh, and the current crisis, uh, triggered in the American housing market, uh, but by virtue of the centrality of American finance uh, to investors around the world, not least European investors, uh, nobody could decouple from that crisis. And we are still in its throats. You feel it perhaps less, uh, but the Chinese are feeling it very much the Brazilians and the South Africans, uh, all the more, and the Europeans most of all, uh, as that crisis lingers. Uh, and the crisis, I think, has, and the way in which it's been managed, mismanaged, uh, by uh, the European institutions, uh, and by the leadership of the key states in Europe, above all the Germans, um, has, I think, put paid to a number of, of left illusions. Uh, even the crisis itself does. OK, what am I thinking of as illusions here? The suspense must be killing me. Um, the first is uh, the Marxian notion, which now has uh, all kinds of conventional tropes uh, that have uh, succeeded it, of inter-imperial rivalry. Marxism through the 20th century largely made its running on the notion of inter-imperial rivalry, especially in the Global South, but not only. Uh, building on you know, the profound understanding although even then it had problems at the time, that great Marxist thinkers like Luxembourg and Lenin Lukar and Hilferding uh, had uh, of the way in which uh, the uh, leading capitalist states uh, in the context of massive capital mobility uh, in the late 19th century uh, were increasingly engaged in building military capacities uh, to capture regions of the world or contiguous territories uh, wherein they'd be able to deepen their capital accumulation having come up against, so it was thought wrongly, the limits of capital accumulation in their own states. A bit like William, William Appleton Williams here, explaining the open door, or at least adopting the State Department's explanation of the open door in terms of the need for outlets for American capital uh, in Asia, in the Caribbean, in Central America, etc. If we're going to get more job growth in the United States, the State Department is arguing in order to explain Teddy Roosevelt's uh, Rough Riders. Uh, we're going to have to uh, create the space for American capitalists abroad. Uh, what was right about the theory of imperial rivalry is that it give, did give rise to World War I, as we well know, and a plausible case can be made for it having had partly to do with World War II. Uh, but the theory persisted, and in the context of American hegemony, what I call the American Informal Empire established after 1945, uh, there was a constant expectation every time that uh, 
there would be some economic problem in the United States, or more often when, as was the American intention, Japan or European states would begin, as was the intention of the Marshall Plan, uh, to develop and export and compete with uh, the United States. That this was uh, for foretelling the uh, return of intramural rivalry. Uh, Gabriel Coco thought, he, again, another Wisconsin historian, thought he saw that as emerging as early as 1948 49. Uh, but it became commonplace uh, by the late 60s, early 70s, and very famously, Ernest Mandel, the late capitalism, identified formation of the European common market, uh, the uh, penetration not only of the European exports into uh, North America, but also European foreign, vet, foreign direct investment by European multinationals, uh, as representing the reemergence of interimperial rival. Uh, you heard the same uh, for Japan in the 1980s. And although because of European stagnation uh, through the 90s, when uh, European Monetary Union finally yielded the common currency, the European Central Bank, uh, you heard all kinds of predictions, again, that the euro would replace the dollar. Uh, but much more than that, given the tensions around between France and Germany and the invasion of Iraq, uh, what you were seeing was the reemergence of intramural rivalry between a resurgent Europe, uh, an increasingly integrated Europe, uh, and a declining American empire, which indeed needed to borrow money from the Europeans in order to prosecute its wars, was the theory. Uh, that's one common illusion. Uh, it has all, as I said, all kinds of conventional tropes now every mainstream uh, journalist in the world is constantly looking uh, at uh, balance of payment statistics, uh, growth rates, etc., in order to be able to predict the displacement uh, of American hegemony, as they usually put it. Uh, the second illusion, I'll come back to why it's an illusion. Uh, uh, much more common in American academia now uh, than in the days when Gabriel Coco taught here at New York University uh, is the varieties of capitalism thesis. This has been the mainstay of comparative politics, comparative political economy, uh, especially in the United States now for, or was at least, in fact, it's over now. Uh, for some quarter of a century. And uh, the uh, essence of the varieties of capitalism uh, approach uh, is one that comes to the conclusion, perhaps not wrongly, uh, that uh, it was right as of at least 1989, if not earlier, of uh, those to conclude that in the sense that Marx or Marxists meant that there would be a successor in capitalism, uh, we had reached the end of history. Uh, not in uh, the sense that there wouldn't be plenty of capitalist history. And therefore, the varieties of capitalism school responded to Reaganism and Thatcherism. And these are all people on the left. Uh, by saying, look, in Europe, there is a humane and competitive variety of capitalism. Uh, one that can compete in international markets, uh, but one that can sustain a welfare state and indeed deepen it. It is a coordinated market economy, as they put it, as opposed to a liberal market economy of the Anglo American type. Uh, and uh, the American left, however broadly that's defined, should be emulating that coordinated market economy 
And that's what Robert Reich brought to Bill Clinton uh, in 1992. And of course, you still find all kinds of elements of it in uh, the Democratic Party's thinking. Uh, both of these uh, left illusions, and, and they're primarily analytic although obviously they are intended to have, to have implications for political strategy, uh, missed what is arguably the most important development in capitalist history. Certainly the most important development in 20th century capitalist history, with continuing effects into the 21st. Uh, and that is what has glibly come to be known as capitalist globalization. Uh, but is much better understood as the deep interpenetration of capitalist economies. Uh, of a kind that the theorists of inter-imperial rivalry could not have imagined with their notion of trust behind a national bourgeoisie who control their state and use that state and its military capacity in order to expand their field of uh, what has taken place, it was already taking place to a significant extent in the first half of the 20th century, got interrupted, of course, uh, by fascism and communism. Uh, but what has certainly taken place, in the, what took place in the second half of the 20th century, is continuing uh, into the 21st, uh, is the interpenetration of capitalism. And the making of global capitalism, uh, the book I did with Sam Gindon, argues that uh, that couldn't have happened without the central role that the American state played in making that happen. Uh, from 1945 on, arguably from 1942 or 43 on, in the planning for Bretton Woods. Um, uh, it is precisely because of the way in which transnational corporations, investment banks, and states themselves have interpenetrated in global capitalism that it is so difficult to try to imagine a world, even if one's imagining China rather than Europe as the inter-imperial rival to American hegemony. Uh, in any clean sense. Certainly in the European case, what happened was that uh, the great inter-imperial rivals uh, uh, became of Europe, the old imperial powers of Europe, uh, the formal empires of Europe, uh, became, through the course of the second half of the 20th century, most integrated and most linked to the American Empire, most tightly linked to the American Empire. Uh, that's not to say there were plenty of tensions, disagreements, etc. Uh, but the depth of political, strategic, military, security, and above all, financial and productive linkages between the advanced capitalist states of Europe and North America are far, far deeper than any of the linkages that existed between those old European empires and their 19th century colonies. Far deeper. Far deeper. It's that that makes both inter-imperial rivalry as an approach to understanding the world and the varieties of capitalism approach to understanding the world. So problematic. We can especially see this if we uh, think about the evolution of the European Union, European integration uh, since 1948. And, and uh, I think it will help us understand uh, where Europe has come to in the current crisis. What Alan Millward, uh, the great historian of European 
situation called the European Rescue of the Nation State, which was a great insight. The argument was that uh, the uh, steel and coal community, uh, the Treaty of Rome, the common market, uh, were absolutely essential uh, for the Benelux countries, for Germany and for France, uh, to reestablish their legitimacy at home uh, after the uh, devastation of the war. That without uh, those international agreements, treaties, economic processes, and Europe by explicitly by when their strategy was led, uh, the European project was led by economics purposely. The political integration was always seen as coming after the economic integration. Milward argued that this laid the material basis for the re-legitimation of a democratic European nation state in the Benelux countries, in France, in Germany, etc. Given the strength of the left, given the discrediting of the old ruling classes, etc. That was not inconsistent. Uh, with the American project of rescuing European capitalism, uh, both from the type of extreme nationalism that interrupted the free flow of capital, uh, as it did General Motors and Ford's investments in Germany, which had taken place by the 1920s. By that point, the American auto industry already owned the German auto industry. It was only under Hitler, that a German auto, the German owned auto industry was reestablished in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, uh, but also, above all, it was a rescue of European capitalism, uh, not only from the threat of the Soviet Union, uh, but from the threat of communist parties, large communist parties in Italy and France, and inevitably, and of course you see it, and you'll see it tonight when you watch the Republican debate again, uh, all kinds of tepid social democrats. Uh, like Clement Attlee, were also seen as uh, threats to European capitalism and therefore to American capitalism uh, in the post-war era. Uh, the European rescue of European capitalism, uh, the American rescue of European capitalism was very much consistent uh, with the European rescue of the nation state and indeed the Americans, through the Marshall Plan, through their insistence on the European Payments Union, uh, uh, in 1950, uh, through their encouragement of the Treaty of Rome, uh, through above all their, convert, their encouragement of the removal of exchange controls and capital controls in Europe as early as possible, uh, uh, they were engaged in uh, an important process of uh, rebuilding a European capitalism. Uh, at a time when European, when American multinationals and investment banks were not interested in Europe. Given the devastation of the war, uh, Europe's problem that there was, was that there was no possibility of a capital flow into Europe. Indeed, the main reason for capital control uh, was to prevent whatever capital remained in Europe at the end of World War II from flowing immediately to Wall Street. Uh, and the Marshall Plan was to some extent uh, seen as offsetting capital to uh, the flow that would occur once exchange controls and capital controls were removed in Europe. It was thought that all capital would immediately flow to the United States. Uh, there was a price to pay for this. Uh, William Dusenberg the first head of uh, the European Central Bank uh, at a speech marking the 50th anniversary of the Marshall Plan called it the world's first structural adjustment program. Uh, and indeed, uh, uh, upon the receipt of Marshall funds, uh, each European state was expected uh, to sign on to what at that time was a relatively draconian commitment to balance budgets 
and to trade liberalization. Uh, a marvelous book by another University of Wisconsin uh, former great professor, one who's still alive in this case, uh, Wolfgang Street, uh, called Buying Time, which I urge everyone to read. It's tremendous. One of the best analyses of uh, the European crisis uh, and its roots uh, uh, going back over 30, 40, 50 years that you can read. Uh, Street uncovered a essay that Hayek wrote in 1939 in which he called for a United States of Europe, a supranational uh, government of Europe, which he said, I realize the British and the French will not want. Uh, but the advantage of it is that if we got it, it could be the type of supranational governance that would not allow for socialist economic planning in Britain and France. Uh, and then later in the essay he says, it would be the prophylactic against the use of democracy by the masses against individual freedom. And Street really rightly says, it wasn't a matter that Hayek in the late 40s or 1950s Hayekian ideas captured uh, Europe. Uh, it was the, indeed sometimes said that when uh, the rest of European policymakers read Keynes, the Germans read Hayek. And it is indeed true that uh, German central bankers uh, have always been very Hayekian in their orientation. That's true. But uh, Shriek is not making this point in dredging out this old article in order to say that contemporary neoliberalism was rooted in Hayekian ideas and the notions of ordo liberalism in 1948 in, in Germany. Rather, he puts it this way. It was as if Hayek's article, 39 article, had worked out in advance the lines of force along which the institutions of European unity, uh, originally unintended for something quite different, would eventually position the institutional dynamic foreseen by Hayek in 1939 uh, did not suddenly begin in 2008. It was the result of a continuous metamorphosis through the jumble of contradictions since the 1980s of global liberalization or the making of global capital. And I think that's a great insight. It was more a matter of Hayek having sensed the contradictions of the attempt to democratize capitalism, where they would lead, that led him to intuit the likelihood of a supranational set of institutions being able to limit in the way that Europe now does radical democratic expressions in any of the individual nation states. I'd go further than Wolfgang and say that the roots of this don't go back to uh, the 80s. And in fact, he himself, in the book, if you read it carefully, argues that they actually go back at least to the contradictions of the Keynesian welfare state, the fiscal crisis of the state in the 60s. Uh, I think they do go back to the Marshall Plan, uh, to uh, the way in which Germany was reconstructed under the aegis of a primacy given to an anti-inflationary export strategy uh, from the early 1950s on. Uh, the key thing that I think we need to understand, uh, and, and I think we need to methodologically engage in an epistemological break finally, is to stop thinking in terms of a world that was made as a Keynesian welfare state world for 25 years after 1945, or a Fordist one, and then one that was suddenly replaced, maybe after the hiatus of the 70s, by a neoliberal. 
all of which tends to get interpreted in terms of the implementation of academics ideas, rather than the actual social forces that make history. The roots of today's neoliberalism go back to, not so much the ideas of German central bankers in the 1950s, or the Taft Republicans in the 1950s, uh, or the Treasury Federal Reserve Accord in 1951, which many people see as the way in which fiscal policy first got limited in the United States by people like Friedman, etc. No, they go back to the contradiction embedded in the Keynesian welfare state, which were present from the beginning. And the mistake that is made is to think that if labor strengthens itself inside a capitalist state, has the capacity to win trade union rights, to win welfare benefits, to win certain universal decommodified forms of provision, goods or service provision, that that means that capital is weak. Maybe in some cases that's the case. But that was not the case in Europe in the post-war era. Labor was strengthened and capital was strengthened. Post-war Europe was an incubator for redeveloping capital strength after the devastation of the Depression and the Second World War. And what happened by the 1960s, and what produced the crisis of the 70s, to some extent even in North America, but certainly in Europe, was that both labor and capital had begun, become so strong that they had, had, had been nurtured to health to such an extent that they were breaking the walls of the incubator. Both European MNCs were breaking out of whatever capital controls and exchange controls still existed in Europe in order to invest in the United States more than in other European countries by the late 1960s. American capital had already broken asunder most of the New Deal regulation. That's why people, when people point to doing away with Glass-Steagall in 1999, as being the roots of the 2008 crisis is laughable. American investment banks have broken out of the New Deal regulations in the way they moved into the city of London by 1958, 59, 60, etc., and established the euro dollar and euro bond market under the aegis of American investment banks. And the way in which they'd also financed American MNCs in Europe through that tremendous influx of American foreign direct investment into Europe, at which point both people as ideologically different as Raymond Devon and Nikos Pouansas were pointing out that Europe was being Canadianized. Uh, uh, so the degree of uh, interpenetration uh, was itself one of the markers of the way in which capital had been nurtured back to strength through the New Deal regulations, through the Keynesian welfare state. And of course, the essence of the Keynesian welfare state was the commitment to Keynesian full employment, which again was not a matter of Keynes's good ideas. It was much more a matter of the strength of labor social forces in various countries. The relative weakness of the American was why the Americans always defined full employment as 4%, whereas the Swedes defined it as somewhere close to 1% in the post-war era. Uh, uh, but the key to the Keynesian welfare state was full employment. The key to the Keynesian welfare state was enough capital accumulation to be able to sustain full employment, uh, both in the private sector and through taxation in the public sector. Uh, through taxation on wage labor, and through taxation on capital, and increasingly through taxation on consumption, increasingly through sales tax, without which, without a 23, now 26% value added tax in Sweden, you couldn't have the persistence of the Swedish welfare state, of course, however much sales taxes may be thought to be regressive 
rather than progress of taxes. Uh, so it, it was the nurturing of capital, the encouragement of the integration of capital, the interpenetration of capital, uh, which was far deeper, of course, uh, tra transatlantically than it ever would be, although we'll have to see what will happen uh, with Asia. Uh, and much deeper than it actually was with Latin America, where it was much more resource-based all of it. Uh, okay. The crisis of the 1970s, which uh, finally gave rise to what we now know as neoliberalism, or there were traces of it around from the 50s on, uh, was a product of a conflict between these two strong forces, these forces that had been nurtured, incubated, right, back to such remarkable health by the 1960s. Under conditions of full employment, uh, workers were prepared not only to make high wage demands, but to resist technological change that would introduce uh, uh, productivity increases. And if they were women workers, as they increasingly were, uh, to tell a manager uh, to get off her back if he was harassing her, or indeed to go to a shop steward, or attempt to form a union uh, if he was harassing her. This was part of the development, of course, of the greatest social movement of uh, the last third of the 20th century, the feminist movement. Uh, uh, that had everything to do with the strength of labor and the importance of full employment at the time. Uh, but that militancy was the basis of a profit squeeze, especially under conditions uh, when, uh, by this point, European capital and exports and Japanese capital by this time uh, were increasingly competitive with American exports. This put limits on the ability of firms to raise prices, right? even though it had an inflationary effect. Uh, but it put some limits on it. Uh, and in that context, you got uh, a decline in profit. Uh, and in that context, uh, the fiscal crisis of the state emerged. Uh, both the product of a tax revolt on the part of well-paid, uh, respectable workers who thought they never would have to use the welfare state, uh, as they increasingly wanted to use their wages for individual consumption rather than collective benefit supports. So there was an element of working class support for neoliberalism always, all the way back to the 60s, but also a limit on how much you could tax capital increasingly was present. Uh, and Streak in particular focuses, as James O'Connor did, on that fiscal crisis of the crisis of the 70s more than the profitability crisis. Uh, and of course, crises never have merely one cause in any case. That's an illusion of a certain reading uh, Marxist thesis of the rate of profit to fall, which too many orthodox Marxists fall into uh, in finding this one formula as the basis of all capitalist pricing. Uh, uh, it was out of that crisis that Bretton Woods collapsed in the wake of the fear that inflationary pressures in the United States, the inability to discipline wage militancy even in the United States, uh, the uh, effect of the black civil rights movement in producing the great society programs, the second wave of the New Deal, if you like, for those who've been excluded from it very largely, right? Uh, that that was having inflationary effects, uh, which would undermine all of the dollar holdings uh, that Europeans now have, now that there was such a surfeit of dollars in Europe, uh, or more likely on Wall Street that Europeans were holding. Uh, and when Bretton Woods fell apart in the wake of uh, Nixon's refusal to impose uh, heavier austerity than the Europeans were demanding in the United States in 1970, uh, when he uh, backed down, as Volcker finally did not 10 years later, from interest rates having been raised to 10% in order to break the back of uh, workers' expectations, whether social wage or individual wage expectations. He backed down on that in the face of the biggest explosion of strike wave 
1970, since 1946. Uh, also backed down because that produced a financial crisis. Uh, there was a crisis in the commercial paper market. Goldman Sachs knew that if interest rates were raised, the short-term uh, bonds that they had been selling for all kinds of corporations to roll over uh, their uh, cash shortfalls, they wouldn't be able to, uh, to refinance them. They continued to sell that commercial paper through the early part of the 1970 to municipalities, to universities. Sounds very much like 2007, doesn't it? And Goldman Sachs spent a lot of the 1970s in the courts for this. Uh, and you may remember the famous Penn Central collapse, the largest bankruptcy in American history at that point as a result of that. Uh, and so it was both the fear of uh, pushing austerity too far uh, in the wake of a labor movement that had not yet been broken uh, and didn't look like it was going to be broken by high interest rates and the fear that raising interest rates would cause a financial crisis now that finance was already so volatile. The New Deal regulations were hardly holding by that point. Uh, that Nixon backed down. And that's what brought about Bretton Woods. I mean, the interpretation that Nixon was a right-wing Republican ideologue who didn't appreciate the importance of embedded liberalism, of what had been achieved by the Marshall Plan, was not true uh, in the slightest. Uh, he backed down in the wake of not being able to hold Bretton Woods together while not engaging in what Volcker and Reagan finally engaged in in the early 1980s. And it took another decade uh, until the American state developed the backbone and capacity they did it when they did it, and this is uh, very important in terms of understanding where Europe was then and is now, under the heaviest pressure from European social democrats, above all German social democrats. Uh, having broken the back of labor militancy in, in, uh, in Germany through getting wage restraint from the trade union movement, which was so closely aligned and remains so closely aligned with the social democrats. Uh, the uh, German Social Democrats were very reluctant to engage in a coordinated Keynesian reflation strategy that uh, Carter's strategy depended on. Uh, uh, the Japanese were slightly more cooperative, but not much. And it was under the heaviest pressure that the United States finally established the value of the dollar as inviolable, as the basis of the measurement of value in all financial transactions around the world remains the case today, that was the case since 1945. The U.S. Treasury bill, the interest rate on the U.S. Treasury bill, is the basis upon which all other financial calculations take place around the world. Still, uh, but in the wake of the instabilities of the 1970s, uh, it took the Volcker shock, the 18% interest rates that Volcker established, and the very, since Volcker was a very smart central banker, uh, the very careful arrangement uh, so that the savings and loans crisis would be delayed for seven, eight years because all of the banks that were funding America, the American housing market would have gone under uh, with that rate of interest. In fact, Greenspan had told uh, Nixon in 1973, Ford, I think it was, in 73, that the reason they weren't able to carry this through is because it would undermine the way in which the American masses finance their housing credit, breaking the back of inflation. It was a, a dilemma of the type exactly that Eric was speaking to. Uh, so the Volcker shock was all very heavy engineering so that the savings and loans banks could get, get engage in all type of financial investments that would allow them to survive in the wake of such interest rates and draw in money in the wake of such interest rates. Uh, but the key to it, as Volcker told Gindin and I when we interviewed him, and we got to interview him because Volcker admired Gindin so much for having been the chief economist of the Canadian Auto Workers Union when they didn't accept the concessions that the American Congress imposed on Chrysler, which led to the break of the Canadian Union from the American. Volcker was put on the Chrysler board in order to oversee the reopening of the, con of the labor contract in exchange for bailing out. Well, we, the Canadians wouldn't accept that. Uh, 
Again, there was then the economist who figured out that the Union could survive free of the Americans. And General Motors was actually defeated in a strike in 84, which proved it. So, you know, Volker wanted to spend his time when we interviewed him talking to Gindin about what happened then. But he said to us very clearly, it was not the Volker shock that made the big difference. It was Reagan's defeat of the air traffic controllers. That made the difference. It was the breaking of the back of U.S. labor, the defeat of trade unionism. A similar thing took place in Europe. A lot of comparative political scientists and political sociologists thought it hadn't. Uh, because union density wasn't broken in Europe. And indeed, because welfare state provisions weren't undone in Europe. But the strength of labor was undone in Europe. Centralized collective bargaining was done away with. In exchange for winning uh, uh, things like a limitation on the number of hours a week, Flexible labor was introduced uh, in virtually every European plant. And above all, and most important, labor was unable to prevent the financialization of European economies. They fretted over it, they worried about it, but at the very same time that the proponents of coordinated market economies were contrasting them with liberal market the Deutsche Bank, uh, Germany's most important bank, was turning itself into a facsimile of Goldman Sachs. Partly to compete with Goldman Sachs, which was writing the IPOs for privatizations of European utilities by the 1980s and 1990s, including German Telecom, the largest privatization in the world at that point, uh, which managed as the investment bank, co-managed with the Deutsche Bank. Uh, the Deutsche Bank decided that the integrated uh, relationship that German banks had had uh, with particular European firms, this was the basis of the notion of coordinated market economies along with close corporatist relationships with the trade union. Uh, uh, Deutsche Bank divested itself of these in order to become a world player uh, in investment banking. Uh, it even argued that it would be a conflict of interest for it to maintain its close relationships with industrial boards of directors insofar as it was engaged in the IPOs and privatizations, etc. Uh, stockholder value became as much a commitment on the part of European multinational corporations, perhaps more, than it did of European multinational corporations. And when people thought they saw inter-imperial rivalry re-emerging when Daimler took over Chrysler, uh, what they didn't recognize was that the central ethos of Daimler since the mid-1980s had been shareholder value, which they had absorbed from General Electric uh, in a uh, very <coughs> open way. Uh, all of this was possible because of the failure, and this brings me to where Eric wants me to end up. Uh, all of this was possible, uh, and economic and monetary union was based on this shift away from coordinated market capitalism, uh, from uh, uh, the retrenchment of the welfare state to the containment of the welfare state, even as unemployment went up and up and up, stagnating at 10, 11% in Germany through the 1990s. Um, uh, European Union, the Green Monetary Union, was based upon that liberalization, encouraged it, and was based upon it. None of this could have happened uh, without uh, the defeat of a number of key attempts during the crisis of the 70s to build on the reforms that had been won in the Keynesian welfare state era in order to finally go beyond the compromise with capital, whereby capital had been strengthened at the same time as labor had. You saw this with the, Meidner, the famous Meidner plan, the wage earners plan in Sweden, which came from the labor movement 
they recognized by the 1960s that their egalitarian wage strategy, whereby uh, the Swedish Social Democrats, the government, would encourage the closure of firms and plants that were low profit and low wage plants, uh, and fund a retraining and a movement of labor into high profit, export competitive plants, that that was being undermined by the fact that the high profit, export competitive plants were no longer reinvesting in Sweden. As capital controls were being removed in Europe, Electrolux was buying up the Italian electrical goods industry, not reinvesting in Sweden. And uh, the left wing of the labor movement in Sweden, uh, led by its research director, Meidner, came up with this plan, uh, which was that in order to continue to get wage restraint from Swedish uh, trade unions, uh, a, a certain portion of capital of each individual Swedish corporation, highly centralized, uh, bourgeoisie in Sweden, 15 families have always owned the banks and major export companies in Sweden, uh, uh, that they, a portion of their capital would be handed over to what was originally called the Union Fund, and then it was called the community fund to give them a broad proper wider basis. Uh, and after some, initially it was thought 10 years, uh, the majority ownership would fall to these community funds. Uh, the most left-wing social democrat in Europe, Olaf Palma, who had been in the Americans' hair during the Vietnam War more than any other European figure, begged the labor movement not to adopt he said, the capitalists will cooperate with us on the best occupational health and safety legislation in the world, but they'll never cooperate with us if what you're doing is taking their capital away from them. Right? Uh, they went ahead and did it, and they not only went ahead and did it, the resolution was amended from the floor when it went through the Yellow Congress and passed, so that it applied not only to firms with over 100 employees, but firms with over 10 employees. And when that was passed, they sang the Internationale for the first time at a Swedish trade union movement conference in 30 years. It was a disastrous tactical mistake because it meant not only big capital was against this in Sweden, but small capital was against it in Sweden by including firms with over 10 employees. And a mass movement was created against it. Adam Jaworski calculated that this had been watered down so much by German social democratic governments by 1984 that it would take 252 years, typical of that, to work that out, before the community funds would have majority ownership of any particular Swedish corporation. Uh, similarly defeated was the Labour Party attempt, the Bennett attempt, the alternative economic strategy, uh, to require planning agreements uh, with the leading corporations if they were to receive any subsidies from the state if they were to secure wage restraint from the union. Uh, part of that eventually, uh, although it wasn't initially uh, part of it, involved taking the five leading banks into public ownership, not simply having a national investment bank, et cetera. That involved, of course, a tremendous fight inside the Labour Party with the majority of the parliamentary party being opposed to it, even though it became party policy. Uh, and it was eventually defeated in the face of Thatcherism. Um, the most significant attempt to go beyond the Keynesian welfare state was, of course, the common program in France, uh, where the Social Democrats, together with the Communist Party, under Mitterrand's leadership, produced the most radical program by far. It was primarily a radical Keynesian one, but it entailed some nationalization of leading banks uh, and insurance companies uh, and, and certain key firms. Um, and and uh, uh, Mitterrand, as uh, one of his allies before said, it, had learned to speak socialist during the course of the 1981 election in France. By 83, there was the famous U-turn, and the key factor in that U-turn was the refusal of the German Social Democrats to agree with Mitterrand that there ought to be amongst the, the leading 10 European countries, a common, coordinated Keynesian strategy for inflation in the face of the Volcker deflation. Um, uh, Schroeder told, uh, uh, Schmidt rather, told uh, Mitterrand 
that he had to choose between Europe and Keynesianism. He had to choose between Europe and the common program. And Mitterrand chose Europe in the face of a outflow of capital. It would have involved introducing massive capital control. Uh, the three percent limit on uh, the three percent GNP limit on any deficit in Europe, which is the core of the European stability pact, which has been applied ruthlessly in the context of the current crisis, was first imposed on Mitterrand in the context of uh, that back then. That's where it comes from. That's its origin. In the defeat of that attempt to go beyond uh, the limits of the reforms in the post-war era. Okay. It was thought at the time that economic and monetary union was realized, the European Central Bank created in the image of the Federal Reserve, uh, but without a commitment to full employment as the Federal Reserve had, was created uh, as the euro displaced the dollar as a reserve currency in a good number of uh, states, not only in the European Union, but in the European Union's contiguous area, that the euro might replace the dollar and that the dollar would be brought down, that the crisis that was predicted so commonly uh, in the early part of the 2000s would be because of American imbalances. Uh, a trade deficit uh, and this enormous capital surplus with the danger that the Europeans, uh, let alone the Japanese or the, Jap the Chinese, might at some point pull their dollar holdings out of Wall Street. This would lead to the collapse of the dollar. In fact, that was not the source of the crisis of 2007, not at all. On the contrary, European capital, Japanese capital, Chinese capital, but European capital more than any of them, including even from those German banks most integrated, semi-public banks, who had always existed in order to supply capital to industrial firms, were investing in the mortgage market. We're investing in American mortgage derivatives, including in the subprime market. David Harvey has shown that the bank that held most of the mortgages in black Cleveland in 2007 was Deutsche Bank, insofar as you can untangle who held them at all, given the nature of the derivatives. Uh, that crisis was caused by the way in which American consumerism was rekindled after the backs of trade unionism were broken in the United States in the 1980s. It was rekindled through making credit available to working class and poor families. Clinton was very proud that that not only applied to the working class and poor white families, but to black families and took great credit for the expansion of the subprime mortgage market into black communities. Uh, the American Treasury in 1998 issued a paper in which it said the world's capital is coming to lend to our poor people so they'll have a roof over their head. Of course, Bush then led every shyster in the business into that market. The Republican Party's base in every community is the real estate agent. I'm surprised most of the more Americans aren't aware of this. Uh, and the congressional inquiry into the crisis showed that in Florida alone, there were 10,000 people pushing mortgages in Florida alone who had fraud convictions. Fraud convictions. But the European banks were fully into this. And when the crisis hit, the first thing the Federal Reserve was doing was lending money to Commerce Bank, the second largest German bank. It was lending money to the Bank of China with it. Afraid that Congress would stop it doing so, it arranged within a few months for swaps at a very large scale to be arranged with the European Central Bank and the Japanese Central Bank, above all the European Central Bank. Very few people realize that the 
Second and third iterations of quantitative easing had more to do with keeping European banks afloat than they did with keeping Wall Street afloat by that point. The danger was, given how in bad shape European banks were, that there wouldn't be overnight loans flowing from uh, Wall Street banks to European banks. Uh, and the quantitative easing was largely a matter of passing liquidity in that way to Europe. But in addition to that, uh, the majority of cash by 2011 being held in the banking system in the United States, the majority of it, or 53% of it, was being held in the foreign branches uh, of, of the branches of foreign banks in the United States. Whereas there had only been some 15% at the beginning of the crisis. So the Federal Reserve became the lender of last resort for the world. And what was very significant about this, and very important in terms of understanding uh, the Euro crisis, is that the European Central Bank refused to play that role. Uh, this has been the great difference between the role that the Germans have played in global capitalism and the American state has played in global capitalism. It goes back to the financial volatility after the breakdown of Bretton Woods where there were a number of big bank failures. The United States and Britain bailed out the banks that were too big to fail even then. When the Herstadt Bank uh, failed in Germany in 1974, uh, the Deutsche Bank let it go under, and there was great danger that the uh, international payment system centered in New York was about to go under. And the Treasury and Federal Reserve had to drag the Germans kicking and screaming uh, into closing up that problem. The, the beginnings of the Basel Accord uh, on capital adequacy for banks, which took 15 years to develop after that, begin at that moment under American pressure. Uh, I've often said that the American state is part of the role it's played in the making of global capitalism has been burdened with responsibility for managing crises. The Treasury defined its role by the late 1990s in, in the United States as failure containment. It was no longer possible to engage in failure prevention because you needed financial innovation in order to be able to fuel integrated global production. You needed derivatives which allowed international hedging, not only by speculators, but by also by exporters and investors. Uh, but the task of the Treasury, it said, and the Federal Reserve was failure containment when the inevitable crises happened. Uh, the Germans in particular, and through the Deutsche Bank, the European Central Bank, does not see that as its role. Uh, the condition for the European um, Economic and Monetary Union project and for the development of the Euro and the Euro Central Bank on the part of the Germans was that the euro act in the same way as the Deutschmark, as a stable facilitator of German exports. Through the first decade of uh, this millennium, it also got the cooperation of the German unions to engage in massive wage restraint and the acceptance of terrific <coughs> changes for labor flexibility in order to facilitate German exports. In that way, indeed, German unemployment Decline. The German exports increased massively, not least to the perif southern periphery of Europe, uh, including Greece. 30% uh, uh, of the German surplus in the year before the crisis was accounted for by what is so, uh, in such a almost racist way, called the pigs. That is Portugal, uh, uh, Ireland, Greece, and Spain. Sometimes Italy is thrown in as a second eye in that uh, acronym. Uh, so a large part of German exports were going to the European periphery, uh, who, were, who were experiencing a trade account deficit, unable to export uh, nearly as much the other way. That was financed very largely by German and French banks. Uh, in the Greek case, it was financed by direct loans uh, to the Greek state rather than directly to Greek banks. But for the other, the, the other part, it was to uh, Spanish, uh, Irish, Portuguese.
Uh, and when the crisis hit, uh, the bailout that the American state engaged in of its banking system, the Europeans, the ECB, did not engage in. Instead, what was required was that the states of the periphery, uh, who either through their state directly or through their developers and their banks owed so much to the European banks who were in such dire straits, uh, was that those countries accept loans uh, in order to buy out their banking systems or pay off their creditors, which and that would be the way in which German and French banks were saved. So if all of the money through each of the memoranda that flowed to Greece in 2010 and then again in 2012, with all of the structural adjustment requirements for austerity, uh, for budget surpluses, for privatization, hardly any of that money stayed in Greece. It was all used to buy off creditors. And most of the most important creditors were the German and French banks. The Americans weren't happy with this. There was enormous pressure coming from the Treasury in particular. And, and the Fed was doing everything it could to facilitate uh, the, the European bank's survival. Enormous pressure by the Treasury, worried about the geostrategic implications of uh, a breakdown in the periphery of Europe. Above all, you know, worried for more military reasons, maybe than economic ones, although also worried about what the example of capital controls might set. Only Malaysia had introduced capital controls in 1997, the time of the Asian crisis, and they only lasted a year. They were very fearful of what the example of capital controls was. And there was enormous pressure. Finally, by 2011-12, the ECB started engaging in purchasing some of the bad debt from European bond markets, etc. Uh, but it did so hesitantly, faultingly, and it's an indication of the relative autonomy that states have, above all that European states have, uh, although obviously all kinds of Asian states have them as well, in this American empire. Yes, they're part of the empire, but it's not the type of empire that can tell these states what to do. Their relationship is such that they usually are on the same page. But in this instance, they haven't been. And the role the Fed has played as the world's lender of last resort has not been matched in Europe. And that's been at the core of the European crisis. OK. It was out of this that in one place only in the world, and this will be what my lecture is about tomorrow, in the whole world, in the fourth great crisis of capitalist history, only one place in the world has a socialist party come into office in the course of this crisis. I mean, parties with socialist labels, uh, but a genuinely socialist party, a radical left party. Venezuela and Bolivia happened before the crisis. Only in Greece were the conditions created such that a party actually not only knocked on the door of the state, but entered the state. Really a monumental development. It didn't only happen because of the conditions that were created in Greece in the wake of this enormous structural adjustment and austerity imposed on it, depression level conditions there alone, 25% unemployment, 100,000 firms shut down. The list is, I don't need to go through the details, I don't want to But there was a party in place that grew out of the attempts in the 1970s to resolve the crisis of the 70s by moving beyond the reforms of the by trying to get out of the dead end of Marxism-Leninism and of Soviet communism. It grew out of the creation of a Euro-Communist party in Greece in 1968 after Czechoslovakia and the various realignments that then occurred to try to find a democratic road to socialism. Uh, so there was a long period of institution building that led 
there to be the possibility of this party finally making a breakthrough and entering the state. It looks like it's failed. I'll talk tomorrow about how and why it's failed, to what extent it's responsible for that failure, to what extent it's simply a matter of force mayor. To what extent, as in the case of the Soviet Union in 1917, the Russian Revolution, there was a break in the weakest link, dependent on, however, that leading to revolutions elsewhere. Of course, the German Revolution failed, and one of the consequences of that was what the Soviet Union became. Right? The aberration of socialist aspirations of the Stalinism. Uh, so the hope that Syriza had that its election would lead to a shift in the balance of forces in Europe has not happened, or at least has not happened fast enough. I'll try to discuss all this tomorrow in a way that is sensitive to, and I think is rightly captured by what Eric talked about as intractable dilemmas. Sorry, I went on so long. Okay. Well. Just a very brief time for some questions today. Uh, there'll be discussion at the session tomorrow, and we'll try to make more time for that. But then a <coughs> rip roaring discussion on Thursday evening at 7 o'clock for all of you who would like to join us there. But we have a few minutes now if anyone would like to raise questions on today's. Sure. Yeah, uh, in your book with Sam Ginn and I, I picked up an interesting phrase that you mentioned. You sort of dismiss the G3 meeting and the class agreement in 89 as kind of window dressing. I think that's a hyperbole. But you, you also emphasize in your book, which I think you brought up today, is the payments union as being more important. Are you going to link the payments union issue into the Greece talk tomorrow? No, but it's a, it was a first instance of an attempt to arrive at stability among European exchange rates in order to facilitate German exports. And the Americans encouraged it as such in, in 1950, in fact required uh, it as a condition for those who were taking Marshall Plan funds. So I was just giving it as an inst a first instance. The second instance was after Bretton Woods, uh, you know, the, the very weak attempts in the 1970s to have exchange rate coordination once you had flexible exchange rates in Europe. Uh, the, you know, the, opportunity costs of trying to have free trade in Europe uh, with flexible exchange rates at a time when you didn't yet have derivative markets in which you could hedge uh, what exchange rates would be, uh, you know, made it essential for the Europeans to try to establish some fixed currency regime amongst themselves. The European monetary system in 79 was really the beginning of what became the euro in a stable way, although it broke down in 1992 temporarily. But you know, the currency union, the euro, is a product of an attempt since 1950 to provide a common currency to all of these different nation states, backed by sovereign fiscal policy uh, in each nation state. Uh, in the absence of a common fiscal policy, in the, con in the absence of you know, what is effectively a supranational state in Europe, there's a common monetary policy now, but there's no common fiscal or budgetary policy. So I was just trying to trace that back to that first attempt. Yeah. Um, as I was listening, I was thinking about implied motives that your presentation had underneath some of it. And I just wanted to ask you um, to comment on the degree to which the European coal and steel community and the movement toward the European Union was very much a reflection of one, the fear of communism coming out of World War II and the resistance leaders that had been the heroes fighting the Nazis and fascists. Um, the way the Marshall Plan was administered, which put the Europeans in a cycle of having to work together instead of carrying out right. revenge right. against each other for the devastation that was perceived to be 
the fault especially of Germany. And um, it seemed to me that that was, th those motives were very strong for the United States because they, the U.S. realized it had to have markets yeah. in order to succeed economically. And Europe was very important to that perception. Absolutely. I know, I think, I'm sorry if I didn't make that more explicit, that was key. Uh, Dean Acheson said in, in a speech to the International Lady Garment Workers Union in 39, at a time when Roseville uh, was looking for a way to get into the war but couldn't carry it politically. He spoke to the International Lady Garment Workers Union, he made a similar speech in Yale a few months later, and said, unless Europe is capitalist, the United States itself cannot remain capitalist. Now what he meant by capitalist was not only communist Russia, he also meant fascist Europe. He also meant a Europe which was open to the free flow of capital and to exports, the open door. You know, the State Department was still close to the tied to the open door at that time. And the planning during the war was oriented to all of that. Uh, now, that's odd to say there wasn't a, it was a very large geostrategic dimension as well. But it was certainly about the understanding, I think proper understanding, uh, that if American capitalism was to flourish given the inevitable dynamism of a capitalism like this overflowing, uh, it needed outlets. Uh, and uh, the conditions had to be created both for uh, the United States not having to pay other countries to buy what it produced, which is what the Marshall Plan was, but also for foreign direct investment to actually take place again. And it wasn't until the mid to late 50s that American MNC started investing in Europe. That original integration was done through the American state, not through American capital. Uh, you know, it wasn't until conditions were established for profitable MNC investment, a, a large enough market to sell to not only as exporters, but as producers inside Europe, uh, that uh, you know, the MNCs came in. But I think you're absolutely right. Uh, yeah, so that, that was crucial. And the fear was that uh, uh, not so much of a Soviet invasion, uh, but that there would be uh, Communist Party governments or participation in government they were most worried about this in 47. Include Greece was the trigger for the Marshall Plan. I'm not sure which way the Greece, the Greek Civil War would work on. Um, which would, you know, impose uh, some sort of economic planning, uh, import controls, capital controls, that kind of thing. Um, you know, I, I think they were also, uh, you know, as I said before, not only worried about the communists, they were worried that there would be a beggar my neighbor policy in Europe. Bretton Woods was above all designed to ensure that what happened after World War I, where the debts you know, were, had to be repaid to one another, would not happen. The Americans oversaw the German debt being forgiven in 53, which the Germans won't allow the Greeks to do now. The Greeks keep bringing that up as if that's going to shame, them, shame the Germans into doing it naively. Um, so yeah, no, I think all of that was, was absolutely crucial to what happened. But it was the basis for the deep interpenetration of European and American capitalism, by which I don't really mean capitalist classes and financial markets, but states, you know, in which uh, the principles of the Federal Reserve and the Treasury and the principles of the finance ministries and central banks of Europe know each other as friends and exchange phone numbers going back to the early 60s at least, if not earlier, and call each other, you know, when 9-11 happens. They immediately ring each other and say, okay, what do we do? We're closing down Wall Street today. How do we keep international financial markets going? A very senior figure in the British Treasury uh, on the international side, in, when Sam and I interviewed him in 2001 to, he was in, Blair was in there, George Brown was chancellor, said to us that he spends more time talking to his counterparts in the American treasury than he does to people across the corridor in Whitehall. 
uh, and you know, I, I, I think for political scientists to talk about these isolated silos of coordinated market economies and liberal market economy, political scientists, and not to see this is very poor social science. I have to say, even though many of them are, you know, <coughs> close friends. Uh, Walden, one last question, and then it's 5:30. Leo, I um, noticed the emphasis you put on the uh, political struggle. And um, are you saying that things could have moved differently if Reagan had lost Batco, to Batco and, and um, Thatcher had if, if lost Volker had learned, had learned so many lessons uh, in 69, 70, 71. Um, so that, you know, what was rolled out finally in 79-80 proved to be very effective. It didn't produce a financial crisis. In that, it didn't produce a financial boom. Yeah, uh, I think there were all kinds of contingencies. I think if the CFTC, the Commodity Trade Trade Commission, had been created in 74 to facilitate the development of derivatives, I think it would have been impossible for the Volcker shock to have succeeded. Um, you know, for a derivatives market and foreign exchange to have been created, which you know is the basis of so much of integrated global production. Uh, it's speculation, but it's a speculation that has a functional effect. Um, I also think, and maybe my real motive, uh, is that had the democratic socialist attempts in Sweden, which would have been exemplary for the rest of the more than any other in, in uh, Britain, in, in uh, France, uh, not been defeated. And they were partly, of course, defeated through external pressures. The Americans thought Tony Benn was boogeyman, and the IMF crisis was you know, very much a matter of the American Treasury being frightened of Tony Benn ridiculously. He was alone in the cabinet with one ally. Uh, you know, Delors said that when he and fellow ministers from Mitterrand's cabinet went into G7 and OECD meetings, they were treated as though they'd come in from Mars. Uh, you know, at a time that the IMF and World Bank was already engaged in what we know as the Washington Consensus. Um, so there was external American pressure, but they were defeated through internal pressures, not through America. That wasn't the determining factor. It was social forces inside those countries, but in most cases it was, you know, very conventional social democratic politicians, very much married to, you know, the compromise they'd engaged in, and, and either fearful or actually, now by now, ideologically opposed uh, to the forces that were pushing up an attempt to find, you know, a, a democratic socialist way. They were the ones who primarily defeated it. Uh, you know, it was much more, well, of course, domestic capital was very important. And that was probably the most powerful force. But yeah, I think on both counts, it was both the learning process uh, that, that people like Volcker and others went through, uh, and uh, yeah, the determination of Reagan, uh, but also you know, the failures on the left. Okay, well with that, please come.